let's get started uh, with tonight's uh, conversation. Nick Mayer, for those of you who don't know him, uh, entrepreneur in residence at the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. Hey, you nailed the whole, the whole long title there. I'm it's reading from impressive. a paper, so it's pretty easy. Yeah, well, reading stuff. <laughs> yeah, let me just go through this quickly. So Nick is an entrepreneur, um, has spent his career founding startups and being product, product or engineer lead for software companies in industries as diverse as social, video, travel, music, and gaming industries. Uh, while he's, um, when he was still in high school, he founded Moog, MMOG, multiplayer on massive online game called Kings of Chaos, uh, with a lot of success. We'll talk about that a little bit. Then um, he also founded Rebel FM, a peer-to-peer -peer streaming music service, um, acquired successfully as well. And then he also co-founded Milewise in 2009, uh, travel meta search engine. Um, so we'll talk about that experience and now transitioning to, the, to your role at MIT. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Nick today. Thanks for having me. Really excited. So it's traditional to start with a little bit of your background. Uh, talking I love, I about love tradition. So. Yeah, we're, nice. So <laughs> where you grew up, how you got started, what drove you okay. towards entrepreneurship? Oh, man. Okay, all the way back. Um, well, thanks to lovely reading of the bio there. Uh, I started my first startup in, in high school, although I think, I think a lot of entrepreneurs um, or people who are inclined to start companies tend to start breaking rules um, pretty early. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people have had a sort of a, an aggressive lemonade stand at some point in their past. Um, uh, mine was uh, drawing comics and selling them for 50 cents to my classmates in third grade. I don't know how they got 75 cents because I think lunch was $1.50. So if you sort of expand that, that's like selling a comic for $5 now, which is stupid. So I knew my customers very well. Um, so yeah, I, I always wanted to make movies and, and games and, and comic books and stuff like that. I wanted to make people happy. So, so uh, I started doing that pretty young. Um, and I think that's a pretty natural extension then to start making things that people want. Um, turns out the rules for a successful artist or a successful video game developer or designer are pretty much the same as um, an entrepreneur. Um, so I started Kings of Chaos with some friends. Um, Technically, I had a friend sitting next to me in the most boring class of all time. And uh, actually, that'd be an interesting analysis to do, like how many big companies were started just because school was really boring. Um, probably pretty high. Um, so I had a friend sitting next to me, and he was working on something on his, he had this like Linux-based Palm Pilot. He was an early adopter. And he was hacking on something in the middle of this class. And I turned to him and said, hey, what are you doing? He said, oh, we're Rocco made a game earlier today and he showed it to me and it was terrible and boring and I said, hey, I've got nothing to do. I'll draw for the next three hours and I'll make you a website. And so later that afternoon, we had a game with a website and more rules. Um, and three weeks later, we had uh, hundreds of thousands of players because um, it's amazing how bored kids in middle school and high school are. And uh, um, it grew quickly. Um, there's all sorts of stories in there, um, but I'll move on. After that, I was kind of addicted. So I went to college. Um, uh, I dropped out of college shortly thereafter because I think once you get the bug, and you, especially if you make something remotely successful, you kind of want to keep trying to make something better than that. Um, so in some ways, success can set yourself, set yourself up for uh, extreme heartache for the rest of your life. Um, but there's also nothing else you'd want to do. Um, so I started this peer-to-peer -peer music streaming company. Because everyone in my dorm was using iTunes music sharing to, to share playlists. They were doing this cool thing where um, they, would, they would actually make a playlist for a party they were having that night and be like, Latin party, and actually no one would have a Latin party, it's college, but it's like Michael Jackson party or 80s party or 90s party in, you know, room, in room 394. Tonight, be there, be square. Although that, not all that fit in a playlist title, so it was more like 90s party come. Um, and you could actually go in there in iTunes because they hadn't locked this all down yet, and it was a new feature, and actually see all the songs, and actually you could like 
instant message your friend and say, hey, you should add this song. So you'd see this sort of group community playlist develop uh, in lead up to the party. And it also advertised the party, so the parties were better. Um, and MIT really likes parties. Um, so I saw that and I said, this should just exist anywhere. Instant messaging still a thing. There wasn't Facebook really. Facebook was just getting started. No API. It was only at Harvard and MIT and one other school. I forget which one. Maybe BU. Um, MySpace was dying. Um, Friendster I never signed up for. So there wasn't really anything. Instant messaging was the, was the social network. Um, and so uh, I was like, hey, let's hook music sharing up to instant messaging and make like a peer-to-peer -peer music streaming network. And technically, it was the same as Spotify. Um, even had, hey, let's, let's do peer-to-peer -peer streaming to reduce the cost of streaming. Because back in the day, not a lot of people had broadband, and it was really, really, really expensive to stream from a big central repository of, mu repository of music. So we're like, hey, let's peer-to-peer let's -peer it. Um, and uh, did that. Moved out west, did, well, did Y Combinator when it was still out here in Boston. Um, moved out west, uh, everyone in the music industry got sued. So I sold my company to Playlist.com and started running that, and then that got sued. And uh, then the entire music industry basically disappeared over the course of the next year, and Pandora, and Pandora was left alive, and Spotify, because it was based in Europe. So there went the music industry overnight. Um, and after that, I had no idea. I was terrified. Um, so ended up just basically falling into the first startup um, I could find, um, which was this terrible idea. It was a great idea, but terrible for me to actually join it. It was about protecting kids on social networks. Facebook and Twitter it was called Social Shield. It actually got sold to Symantec. So it's arguably a success. It actually sold for a lot to Symantec. I just. Uh, Hey, I just hated working on it. We were basically selling fear to parents, saying, hey, we can make sure your kids are going to be safe online. And it's a good idea. It was something that should exist. Um, I did care about it. It was just impossible to implement um, effectively. Nowadays, totally. Nowadays, totally do it. That's why I got bought. But back then, when we were just trying to figure out, is this even going to be a company, and you're running out of money, you're kind of selling fear to try to get your product going and trying to get the product itself to catch up to to both the business and you knowing it's a good thing. Um, but uh, I was 21. I have no business working on a product for parents. <laughs> I mean, it was like aggressive. We call it PMR at MIT, but like primary market research. I'd be like going out to Starbucks and like advertising for parents to come meet me at Starbucks to come talk about, hey, a product that we can build for your kids and I'm doing like card sorting and all these like UX techniques and I've they're like you should know this I mean, I'm like I'm 21 I don't know anything about parenting I don't know learned a lot um, <laughs> that was weird um, but that was that was an interesting that was an interesting experience um, so basically I, I hired my replacement and he did an amazing job getting getting it sold um, and recruiting more team mates and everything um, but after that, I said, hey, the most important thing for me is I want to work with people that I love working with, and I work, want to work on something that I think would be fun. And I want to go back to the East Coast, because East Coast for me feels like home, and the West Coast was getting kind of just tired of it. Um, so I call up my friend uh, from MIT, and I say, hey, I'm thinking of moving back. I know you're living in New York right now. New York's awesome. I'm thinking it would be fun to live there. What's going on in New York? He said, yeah, I'll bring you around to all the, the startup people I know. It'll be great. We'll have a day of it. We'll go to brunch. And I said, what are you working on? I'll just do that. And he says, well, I'm working on this travel thing because my buddy Sanjay is a consultant, travels all day long, and he's got all these freaking flyer miles but has no idea how to spend them. Um, and I'm like, that, that sounds cool. Like." Eventually, we can build an exchange for frequent fire miles, and then we can actually write a patent, which we did. We can write a patent that says, hey, we have a patent on a system of exchange between two currencies that are not currencies, but other things. And there's an exchange rate, and you can sell those and convert them. Yeah, there, we, we had a patent on that. We had a patent on converting frequent flyer miles to credit card points. That's kind of that's absurd. It probably shouldn't have been granted. Um, 
But hey, software patents. Have you licensed it? Have you? Have we? Uh, uh, no. No. Um, not yet, at least. Um, it was actually part of the acquisition. Um, so this company got bought by Yahoo, um, and it got sued by every major airline the minute we started doing well. Which is standard, like in a lot of industries, the minute you start doing well, they're like, oh, we really want to work with you, and they'll have great conversations. And they do want to work with you, because you're the future, and they're not, and they know that. Um, and they'll say, hey, one little, little thing, um, no big deal, but you're going to get a letter tomorrow from our lawyers. Also, you may get it today. Also, it's right here. Um, <laughs> And that letter will be a cease and desist that says you need to start, uh, stop operating immediately before we will enter into negotiations with you. And if you're starting a travel company and you want to get real-time award inventory from American Airlines and United and Delta and all these places, um, you kind of need to talk to them. Um, and they will just gain leverage by suing you. Same thing the music industry does. But they're kind of nice about it. You know? the, the, the airlines will sue your company the music industry sues you and your wife and your ex-wife and your kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Story there from the CEO of Napster. Um, it's great, I'll just tell it. Um, so I was, I was about to head out to the West Coast and I was raising my round, I was finishing it up, and I got connected to the CEO of Napster, who was uh, also an invest he invested in startups. Um, and so I get on the phone with him and he doesn't even listen to me. He's like, look, I'm not investing. I'm, I, this is a, like a PSA, I just want to talk to you. Um, you have to stop this, stop it now, stop working on it. I'm gonna just tell you a story. Last time I was, I was negotiating with the labels with Napster and I go into the offices of, I think it was, I don't think it was Sony because they're generally nice, but I think it was Warner. And uh, it's like I go into their offices and before I can even start talking, they get this big envelope and they slide it across the table and they tell me to open it. And I open it up and there are satellite photos of my house, my wife's house, my ex-wife's house, my kids, everybody. And he, he, told, he tells me, what they say to me, said to me was, we're gonna take all of it. We are going to take everything, all of it, doesn't matter. And he spent the next 10 years getting sued personally by the major labels. Like no one, no one talks about that. The, ma the labels just sued people individually for 10 years just so they would never do it again. And it wasn't that long ago. We were still kind of living in this like aftermath of this terrifying digital music system. The fact that Pandora survived and Spotify exists um, and like Songkick, uh, Last FM, Amy Street, these companies like risked a lot, actually, to get the music industry even remotely close to where it is today, and it's still insane. You're not seeing, and you're seeing very little innovation in the music industry right now, and the only innovation you are seeing is, is you, it's like tied to blockchain, like this ownership problem. How do you kind of get rid, how do you, how do you like get, get the music industry sort of out of this land of thuggery it is in right now and, and get it to something that sort of makes sense? Um, it's really interesting. I'm really excited for music, especially like over the next five years. That'll be cool. Where do you see those changes happening? Um, I think uh, I think a lot of the changes you're going to see are, are are from the sort of techno anarchist movement of of blockchain and Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, the same kind of people that you know you ha a lot of these early really cool early movements come from people kind of you know giving a big middle finger to the man a little bit and just trying to do something really hard. Um, so I think cryptocurrency sort of started that way. Um, been a lot of, like, a lot of, ha MIT especially had this sort of hacker ethos back in the day that started a lot of the internet age. Um, but that same group that's kind of like, hey, I just don't like that currency and trade works this way and that it's centralized and, and controlled by banks. Um, there should be a better way to move money around. Um, the world would work better. Those same kind of people are the kind of people that would say, I'm going to fix ownership on the internet. Um, that's kind of the same thing. Uh, you talk about who owns, who owns a, a dollar bill. Well, it's pretty obvious. I give it to you, you give it to him, it's obvious who owns it. Make that dollar bill a digital, right? <laughs> You're like, it's not that obvious. Make the thing a digital asset and then all of a sudden it's a, and then what happens when you have to cut that dollar bill up into lots of pieces? Well, now everything's crazy. Um, and then you can start arguing about 
whether that dollar bill even existed in the first place and then when it existed. Oh, when was the dollar bill created? Oh, you don't know? Right. This is digital currency, right? Maps pretty well to ownership of digital goods. Um, but it'll be interesting. Seeing a lot of stuff around like uh, if you could build tools, so Spotify kind of worked on this back in the day. A lot of their rise was the sort of European independent music rise, and so they could get this massive user base that wasn't really controlled by any entity. A lot of startups capitalize on these sort of small movements and then layer ambition on early traction. So they were able to start early. Um, I could see music and media in general creating new creation tools that actually allow you to say, no, I made this in this tool or this ecosystem is definitively mine. I'm collaborating with these guys. They own that. We're negotiating our rights, sort of like GitHub for music, things like that. And then you end up with, uh, um, you end up with this whole value chain of sort of ownership and you have like an API that other people can innovate on. That would be really cool. Um, and you're seeing that MIT is digital currency initiative. Part of that is actually the major labels are working with them to sort of sort these things out. Yeah, surprising because the history of crowdfunding started yeah. with a, by a Scottish band called Marillion. I'm a big fan of the band. Really? I actually didn't And the didn't first know that. time I Googled them, they pop out in Wikipedia as the, the first people who ever got uh, business and concerts organized by a community. Yeah. And they prepay their Oh. That's actually really cool. I don't know that. It's okay. No, it's okay. Okay, now. Yeah. So, so let's go back. You were you were at, at Yahoo at this point after uh, getting acquired. Um, yeah, I guess I digressed. It's um, okay. Yeah. It's part of the conversation. Um, is that how they work? I don't know. It's new. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. So we worked on Milewise for four years, um, and uh, it was really, really. It was it was a tough slog because you know a year and a half into it, we built this great product that people love it. It wasn't really growing stratospherically, but it was the quality and usefulness of the product was so high that we had just some diehard users. I think we had around 40, 50,000, um, which is not a high number, but when those 40 or 50,000 people spend on travel, like the equivalent of 100 everyday travelers, because they're business travelers, that's like having a million hardcore, like a lot of money was flowing through the system. Um, and so we had these hardcore users um, but we got sued in the middle of it, right? So we're, uh, we're kind of just working on the product, but not able to really, we don't get to see the fruits of our labor because we kind of have to shut down airlines. It sucks. You do a bunch of work and then it gets taken away. It's like, what's the point of even being here? We're just negotiating and we're engineers. We like to build stuff and ship things. And it's very demotivating for engineers and designers to do all this creative work and have it go nowhere. Um, and so we got to this point where we actually did get a deal. We got term sheets with the airlines, first ever. Um, these uh, options on actually getting this data that, that was completely locked up before. Um, and the airlines were really excited because the airlines make almost all their real profit revenue uh, from selling frequent flyer miles to credit cards. So if you get a Chase Sapphire and you get you know, two miles for every dollar you spend, that's because they bought a billion dollars worth of frequent flyer miles from the airline. That's not some sort of small deal. It's massive revenue for the airlines. So they were psyched about us because we get people valuing the miles more, which means they can charge more to the credit card companies. So they loved the idea of us. Um, but we had to make this decision. We'd basically been slogging it through for four years. If we do an A round, um, do we... It's a decision point. You take an A round, and then you have to sell for $100, $200 million to really make the same return as you could if you sold for like 10 to $20 million that day. Um, and then you're committing to another three or four years of, of growth and pushing it. Do we really, do we really want to spend another four years working on travel? Um, and the team looked at each other, and we said no. So, but we've got a great product, a great team. We can make real revenue off this thing. Um, a lot of industries are interested. Let's try and sell this thing. Um, and the first thing you do when you sell a company is uh, you call your investors and say, hey, I hope you guys can be behind us, but uh, we want to sell this thing. Help us, help us make some money, and you too. And uh, 
as long as they agree, the good investors will say, hell yeah, send us in, coach. Because, I mean, what are they? They're professional deal makers, right? And you get an army of, I'm assuming you've done a seed round with, you know, 10, 15 investors. Boom, now you've got an army of deal makers who are basically getting a cut of what the output is. You've got a sales team now, right? So that's what we did. And um, talked to everybody for different reasons. Um, we got, we, we, we were noticing, we were in New York, um, which for us was a big asset this time because everyone was moving their companies to New York. Dropbox, Facebook, Google, and Twitter were all setting up brand new offices in New York at the time, and they didn't have them staffed up. So that's one of the real driving reasons of that aqua hire spree out in New York at the time of like 20 companies getting bought in six months. Um, they were staffing up. Um, so there was that going on. And then the other thing is we had all these credit card companies and airline companies trying to be more innovative. And so we went out there and we were able to get offers from them too. So we were able to get a bit of a bidding war going. Um, and it worked out. So I was there. I realized I didn't answer your question at all. I just talked about getting to Yahoo and not actually being at Yahoo. Well, that's, that's great. I mean, it's part of, <laughs> love the story about the experience of the, the reality of entrepreneurship, how it works, yeah. how you cut the deal, how you make decisions. That's part of the learning process. So yeah. great. So after that, you started another company before joining MIT, correct? I did. And we should just jump to that because um, Yahoo, Yahoo was, was great, but not for me. The rest of my team stayed and they, uh, for I think four years, one's still there. But uh, um, I think 365 days is good enough for me. And uh, so I left on day 365, and uh, I, I joined up with two other guys who I'd worked with uh, at Yahoo. And what we had done at Yahoo was, was we, were all, we, were, we were starting the video team at Yahoo. So we were building Yahoo Screen on, on iOS and Android and all these platforms. But the three of us, what we wanted to do was, was bring it to the living room. So we got to know each other. We shipped uh, video products on, on, on Roku and, and Xbox 360 and all these different platforms. We got to know each other, so we said, hey, let's start a company. You sold your company to Yahoo. I sold my company to Yahoo. You're a great designer. Let's get together and make a good family. And just we, started, we just started hanging out and having um, brainstorming sessions about what we'd want to do next. Um, yeah, we were really slumming it. We, uh, we would go to like Soho House for, for brunch. It was, one of them had, a, had an invite there. And uh, that was pretty fun. Because in startups, you're not really used to anything nice. <laughs> so, so that was refreshing for me after being on like $30,000 a year salary for three and a half years. Uh, not used to it. Um, so uh, we ended up having, we looked at a bunch of stuff. We were honestly, so iOS 8 had just come out, or it may have been 7, but I think it was iOS 8, and uh, um, the big thing there was like this iBeacon and, and location tracking stuff, making it super cheap. And so we spent a lot of time looking at Bluetooth low energy and iBeacons and is there anything there, is there retail in there? Because we were close friends with an investor that was into retail, so we said, hey, if we could do something cool in retail, he'll invest. So. Brainstorming is a very odd process. You take any prompt you can to generate a cool idea. Um, and so we eventually started looking at this fact that, hey, um, LTE has finally gotten really good. Um, phones have finally got video and GPU chips in there that can render and stream video without using your entire battery. Um, and Android and iOS both have these new chips coming out which make it really power efficient to track your location all the time. Um, and that was key because before iOS 8, you couldn't track someone's location all the time. That's why there was all these dating apps that started pre-Bumble. Is it Bumble? I'm asking Adam, but <laughs> so just to embarrass you. <laughs> uh, that would like try and match you up with people or in invite you to parties if you're in the same place. None of them ever worked because they couldn't work. Um, they couldn't tell where you were all the time. Now you can. Now Uber tracks you all the time, right? And they get slammed for it. Um, and so we're like, hey, there's all these trends going on. Uh, what should we do? And we, we kind of settled on this pitch of, hey, everyone's running around with, with basically video cameras attached to a high-speed internet network. What if we brought that all online, put it onto a marketplace, and made a marketplace for 
high definition video anywhere in the world. And that's where we'd start, but eventually really be a platform for data on demand. So we were, a lot of our friends were working on autonomous cars even back then, so we said eventually they're gonna need a lot of video data, um, machine learning is gonna be a thing, they're gonna need lots of data, and there's gonna be a huge market for on-demand data. And we're gonna start with live video. Um, and when you pitch, you have to have these sort of long-term trend visions where it's like, hey, we cannot, um, and we said this, it's, can you imagine a world where you're not gonna be able to pay $5 and get a live video of anywhere in the world in five, 10 years? And VCs, because they underestimate time all the time, say, no, can't imagine a world. And so, um, and for good reason, VCs were pretty interested in this pitch, especially when you think about the long-term implications and you match it with all these sort of trends. And so uh, we raised money for this and um, started working on it. We said, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of technical and social risks here. Um, we're making a lot of assumptions here about one, what do people actually want live video of? Not really sure. Um, we made a bunch of guesses and we were clear there were guesses, but no idea if that's true. Um, two, we also made an assumption that people uh, will only go and film things if they're paid. Maybe that's not true. If people will use for free, maybe that's, that's a huge business asset. Low percentage chance, maybe a 1% chance that's true, but if it is true, we're sitting on like a really counterintuitive gold mine potentially, so let's test that. Um, so the first thing we did is we built out some live video tech and we made a, a social app called SUP. Um, the company name was originally Luxy. Um, so we made a video app called SUP, which was basically, Snapchat was pretty new at the time and we sort of, that seemed to be doing a pretty good UI, so it had like 50,000 users or something. But, so it's like, okay, you'll have a list of friends, you tap on their name, they'll get a notification that says, Nick wants to know what's up. And if you accept, it opens up a one-way video stream from your, you to your friend. And uh, you basically, it's just one way. So it's just a fun little way for me to check in, I can see what you're doing, and then we were testing this sort of controller UI where I, like let's say I'm looking through your camera, and you're out in Times Square for some reason. I don't know why would anyone would go there, but you are. And uh, I swipe left, you'll get a little thing, turn left, you'll turn left. I swipe right, you turn right. I swipe forward or up, and you start walking forward. And it turned out to, to be a pretty good UI and a, a pretty fun sort of game-like mechanism um, for sort of controlling another human being. <laughs> um, and that's what we built. And it actually worked pretty damn well. Um, we had a few different models of it. One that was like Periscope, where anyone could go online and would notify our friends on Twitter and stuff like that. Played with a model like that. We played with our sort of sub model. We played with um, one of, uh, we got some friends who are musicians to, to sort of go and broadcast stuff. We played with like more of a broadcast model where it's one to lots, and there's, those are sort of celebrities. And we played with one other model, which is we actually had these little turnable robots we built, and we put them in a coffee shop, we put them in the High Line Hotel, um, one in my apartment, and anyone could actually sup the robots and actually control the robot by, by and you get like a, a 10 second slot to sort of checking what was going on. And we went and actually tried to sort of sell this concept to restaurants. So in six months, we shipped a lot of stuff, um, which is an advantage of, of raising one and a half million bucks in, on the first day. You can hire, you know, four people and really go at it. Um, but if you're gonna do that, try a lot of stuff. Because a lot of people just hire a bunch of people and they say, oh, I'm gonna do one thing faster. Um, you should probably just save the money. And you're probably not gonna be faster um, unless you've got a really experienced team. Um, yeah, I'll, that ended. Um, <laughs> there's a new company, it pivoted. Um, but I'll, let, I'll, I'll let, leave it up to you to... Oh, so so, so how do you transition? You moved after that to MIT, correct? You got, went back to MIT, or there's something in between? Yeah, yeah, there was, there's all, yeah. See, in, in startups, like, usually you're not putting everything on the resume, because sometimes you just start things for three months, and then they fizzle and blow up, and you say, ah, not even worth it. Why go on the resume? Uh, we started, a, we, we got some acquisition offers around the video thing, but we'd all just done acquisitions. So all the founders had just done acquisitions. We had no interest in selling early. Um, so we went to a cabin in the woods for a week and um, 
went through a brainstorming exercise on what we'd do, because we still had a million, we had a million bucks left in the bank. And we're like, what do we, we either have to give the money back or we need a better idea. Because we already messed up once. Um, we need something big, or at least compelling. Um, and so, of course, in the winter, we decided the big idea was a, a instant frozen yogurt machine. <laughs> um, no joke. And uh, we actually ended up pitching that. And after looking at the business of frozen yogurt, um, and we actually built and shipped that. Um, well, I hired my replacement uh, out of SpaceX first because I'm not a hardware engineer. So we hired a, we found on LinkedIn a thermal propulsion engineer from SpaceX, super overqualified to build a frozen yogurt maker. <laughs> but uh, startups is about about recruiting, right? And uh, so after that's when that's when I went to MIT <laughs> because I hired my replacement for that. So how do you end up? Uh Joining MIT, where, how, where do you start there? How, how did it happen? Yeah, yeah. So I had gotten an email from actually a fraternity brother of mine um, at MIT who uh, was going through, who just went through, MIT's got a summer startup accelerator. Now it's called Delta V. At the time it was called GFSA, Global Founders Skills Accelerator. And uh, I know, we like long acronyms at MIT. And um, he'd just gone through, he started a space propulsion company, which is really cool. So there's a company called Axion. And um, he had sent me an email said, hey, Nick, they're looking for a new entrepreneur residence at this program I went through. Um, I don't know anyone else who started a bunch of companies and would actually want to do this. Um, sure, you've got your own thing going on, but here it is. And I did have my own thing going on. But after this massive pivot to frozen yogurt, I really didn't know what to do with myself. And um, honestly, there was a bit of a confidence hit through all that because um, even if you are involved in the founding or a pivot of an idea, the f hiring your own replacement is always pretty terrible. Um, even if you actually do kind of want to do something else. And uh, there's kind of this ego hit of why aren't I a thermo propulsion engineer from SpaceX? I could be. I could go back to school. I could learn this stuff. But I wasn't and I didn't. Um, and so and I, I don't know if anyone's ever had to hire their own replacement and then quit their own startup that they spent a year doing, but it, it totally sucks, um, even if it's the right thing. Um, so I remembered my friend's buddy saying this. I said, you know, maybe this is exactly what I need. I'm not ready to do another startup. I'm kind of exhausted from all these things. Um, it would be nice to stay in the scene and try and make everything else I'd done feel worthwhile. There's something about teaching other people something, even if they're on your employees, that it makes your entire life kind of feel worth it, no matter how bad it was. And um, this works especially well in startups. So I highly recommend to anyone, if you're looking for a way to make you feel good about what you did when you were 23, um, teach people stuff. It's really nice. Um, so I sent a bunch of emails to people at the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship and uh, sat back ready for my job offer, and I didn't hear anything. Um, so then I went skiing, and then I checked my email when I was done with that, and I still hadn't heard anything. So I went skiing again. Um, and eventually, I think I realized that they weren't going to email me back. Um, so uh, at this point, I had decided that I really, really wanted this thing. And I hadn't really wanted a job in a long time. I'd wanted to be successful and start a company or learn something. I never really, really wanted a job. Um, and so I fly from Switzerland to, to Cambridge purely for the purpose of walking into the, the trust center and acquiring a job interview. Um, and this, this is how entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs get stuff done. This is just bullhead your way into whatever you want, for better or worse. and. Uh, so I walk in and I say, hey, I'm Nick Meyer. And they say, oh, yeah, we were totally going to write an email to you. But if anyone goes to the Trust Center, you realize that there's like, not a lot of people doing an incredible amount of stuff for all of MIT. And last year, MIT started 1,000 different companies. Um, there were like 1,000 student projects 
and hundreds of them turned into startups. So they're pretty darn busy. I didn't really appreciate that until I went and saw what was going on. Um, and uh, so I, and he's like, okay, sure, um, we can meet with you. Uh, how's next week? And I said, no, 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 uh, I'm flying out tonight. I'm here for eight hours. I have to go back to the airport. Um, are you free at two? I can go get coffee. Um, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. I went and got coffee and came back for my job interview. And, uh, you know, it was much like this. And, uh, you know, nothing like this. And uh, so they see, so, so I, I do my thing. I get back on the plane. I land in Switzerland. And I get an email saying, hey, someone else wants to talk to you. Can you, can you come in tomorrow? I just told you I was going back to Switzerland, but sure, I guess I'm coming back. So I get um, immediately turn around, go back to the airport, fly back. This is all in frequent flyer miles, by the way. <laughs> I have no way I would have been able to do it <laughs> using my own product. Um, by the way, if you do want to use your miles, we did. We actually had an MIT PhD write a thesis on the best time to use their frequent flyer miles. It's the Wednesday within a week of booking the flight on American Airlines, actually. Actually, it's with American Airlines, but on like British Airways or something like that. Um, so in general, prices go down the closer you get to the destiny, to the, the time when you have miles. It's, they go up with cash, so just FYI. Um, something, something about this has to be helpful, so we gotta help them out, right? right. Yeah. Um, so that's how, I, that's, that's how I got, eventually, you know, I talked to them enough and, and got the job, but you know. Uh, in some ways, I think they were just looking for free labor during the interview too, because they kept just, emailing me student questions. Be like, hey, Nick, we have this situation. Um, and it's made up, seriously, but uh, what would you do in this situation? And it was actual student startups eventually. I just realized, eventually I realized I was just writing emails to students as a job interview, which is a good way to interview, right? Um, so it was fun. Nice, so, so talk a little bit about the, your work there now and the, the programs that uh, the center has. Yeah. How does it work? Yep. Um, so the key about MIT is realizing that it's this kind of chaotic bottom-up organization, and so you're all, everyone's always sort of competing for the love of the students, um, which is a pretty good kind of startup y entrepreneurship kind of atmosphere. Um, so right now we do a, f a few things, but it's always changing. Uh, we run Delta V, which just wrapped up. It's our three-month summer accelerator. It's awesome. Um, it's like, it's kind of, Y Combinator, but it's educational, um, so it makes it really safe. It, we're totally happy if you, you know, uh, work your work your ass off, and then your startup fails then the month because you realize, you know, one, I don't really like startups that much. Hopefully, you should have that figured out by then. I don't like startups that much, or it's a bad idea, or a big enough market, or hey, I discovered something bigger. You know, we're totally okay with that. But investors, not so okay with that. We'd rather you pivot a couple times in school, or right after school and then go raise your round, or do an accelerator or something. It's, you know, um, if you could, so people talk about grit um, being like a really important property of a founder, grit and, and uh, you know, hustle and all these things. Um, grit has to kind of be earned. You have to realize that everything can work out, so you have to be hit and, you know, kicked in the face a couple times. Um, so we try and do that in school, when you basically, the worst that can happen is you do it again. Um, anyway, we also teach a, bu a bunch of classes. Um, one I'm really excited about is Intro to Making. It's how to make stuff for people that have never made stuff before um, or don't have confidence in making. Um, we also do a program called Fuse. Um, in the spirit of, you know, in entrepreneurship, we have to make stuff that people want. Um, we have to make classes and programs that people want. Um, so one of the things we were noticing is, hey, we're getting a lot better at this whole teaching people entrepreneurship thing. By the time they get to, you know, halfway through their, their first year, um, they've taken classes, they've maybe gotten a little bit, you know, like a thousand bucks from, from Sandbox uh, to try a project out. So they're getting to a high level much sooner in their two or three or four year uh, um, career at MIT than they were just the year before. We need a new program that lets them test their skills early. So they get to find out what it's like to actually be a founder. So we created this program called Fuse, which is like, it's an actual boot camp. Um, it's a month of just 
Oh, you're a found you're a founder now. You want to try a founder? Okay, let's do this. I mean, I, I warned you, but let's let's do this. Um, and so we started them off. We'll say, hey, what's what's your what's your goal? And what's your goal for this thing? And they'll say, oh, by the end of Fuse, we'd really like to have a prototype. And we're like, cool, cool. Um, no, that's 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 terrible. That's that's shit. Uh, how about by the end of the week? And why do you need a prototype anyway? And so we set them a goal for the week. Then the next week, we set, we start having them set goals for the day because they've realized, oh my god, I've learned all this stuff, and you can move a lot faster than I thought you could. So what I thought you could do in a week, you do in a day. So we start getting that, and then we get them down to thinking an hour. You know, value in an hour. What can I do this hour to push my product ahead? Um, and when you think about it, everything uh, down to the hour level, you stop doing stuff like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna like research this new technology or something like that, or I'm gonna like. I'm gonna make this piece of code a little bit faster. You start thinking like, okay, I'm gonna walk to Starbucks, I'm gonna find someone that looks like they just got it out of yoga, and I'm gonna ask them about this new nutrition uh, company I have, right? And that's awesome. So, so that's the kind of stuff we're trying to do, but that is all, that's changing constantly. Um, so, so the goal of the program is to help accelerate students' ideas, go them, take them through the entrepreneurial experience. Yeah. program? Do they get funding? Do they get uh, just uh, a yeah. course credit? So yeah, it depends. Um, there are, we do like to set, funding, funding is tough in academia, right? Um, the reality is there are a lot of things, especially at MIT, if we're saying, hey, we want you to create companies that change the world and work in energy and stuff like that, usually you do need some money to get started. Um, we have a couple programs. We have Sandbox which is new, I think it was seed funded with about $2 million from a lot of local VCs actually, but it's equity free, you apply with basically anything and you'll get a thousand bucks just to get started and do something. And that's, that's the whole point of it, is to get more computer scientists and business students and everyone to just do anything, just do anything. And money turns out as a shiny thing that works really well. Um, once they start doing stuff, they'll get addicted and they'll start being, well, the first time the thing fails, they'll go seek out an, an expert. And so that's like a nice cognitive behavioral therapy thing to hack to get them to come talk to us. Um, so that's sort of the start. And we've got classes that's saying, oh, okay, you're trying to make this thing and actually work and you want to make money and have a startup? Okay, let's teach you about, let's teach you about stuff like c acquiring customers and how, how, um, how you acquire them and how much it costs to, to keep them and sales and product design and market segmentation. We'll teach you tools that you can use to actually get stuff done. Um, so in Sandbox, there's money. There's no money or anything in the classes. Fuse especially has no money attached to it because what I'm trying to do there is realize, hey, no, no founders start with money. If you, you want some money, go find some money. I'm not giving you any and no one else is going to give you any because your idea is terrible right now uh, and you haven't proven anything. And that really gets them to start thinking, what can I do with less? And that's a, that's a really big deal that I hope isn't lost through all these programs that just kind of give you money. Like, all, like um, I'm wary of business plan competitions, for example, um, where you just, you can basically come in with an idea, pitch it really, really well, and it sounds good and you're getting 10, 15, $20,000 more a lot of the time, but maybe it's not a real thing yet. Um, I'd much rather we had competitions that were more like, hey, we're gonna do a pre-competition in January, and we're gonna hear about your idea, and then we're gonna see who gets furthest by March. I don't know, Any, anything would be cool, um, just to show some commitment. Um, Delta V, we give you $20,000 equity free. Private donors donate that, so there's no signaling risk. One of the big things we do in the center with our programs no VC involvement any, at any level of the funding chain. We want no, no signaling risk. We, want, we don't want this idea that, hey, VC comes in or an angel investor comes in and they don't invest in you later. That could be a negative. So we don't want any of that. Um, we don't want anyone in our, at least working at the center to, uh, we're, we're really serious about your, um, like this, this no, no conflict of interest policy. We call it an honest broker policy. Um, you know, no one's no one's uh, like a venture partner. No one's a, a VC. No one's angel investing in the startups that it see. Although a lot of faculty do it at MIT. In our center, none of us, none of us do. 
Um, and it's a big deal just to be able to say, honestly, I do not care what happens to your startup. I just care about what happens to you. Um, it makes it hard to recruit for our center. Really, really hard. Um, it also makes, uh, I, think, I think a lot of academic institutions that want to help with entrepreneurship are going to run into the same thing, where it's, it's, it's hard to recruit and it's hard to, the downside of making a poor decision is high too. Because um, you, you honestly could have sort of one, one person come in and, and kind of just act based on what they want. Um, and that can really hurt a lot of students. And they pay a lot to go to school, a lot. So we don't want to do that. Um, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you said that a lot of the student projects become startups later on. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about that, but I also wanted to know if there's any, any issues with IP or does the school, is the school involved uh, in helping to develop the technology? IP, IP is huge. That's a good thing to talk about. Um, so schools, if they want to, I mean, the key to an entrepreneur, at least one of the keys to, to a well-functioning academic entrepreneurship ecosystem is that you can easily move your stuff out of school, right? Um, and that investors can trust that it's going to be easy to move your technology out of school. That's a big one, too. Um, uh, and so MIT has a trademark licensing office. Um, anyone who creates, they'll file patents for you. Um, they'll help you with your patent strategy or licensing strategy. Um, and they will give you an exclusive, they will sell you an exclusive license to your own technology um, at pretty standard, very reasonable rates that is, doesn't usually get in anyone's, anyone's way. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, that is helpful. Um, the, so that's, that's one side of it. So schools need fair rules around that. And ideally, a track or sort of a standard track record where it's not a surprise, it's not a negotiation every time, it just needs to be like a factory. Get it out the door, get it done. And time is really important. Um, uh, the other thing that needs to happen is, um, and this is a big struggle, is uh, faculty need, need to understand startups. And, um, you know, whether they're good or not good or not good has nothing to do with it. You know, if you, do, if you don't understand that, hey, 99% of the work of a startup happens after sort of the technologi technological in invention itself, um, one, the technology is probably going to change because um, you realize, it's, oh, it turns out it's not super commercializable or, hey, we can't even manufacture the thing. Um, uh, that's a big one. Um, so faculty need to not do stuff like ask for 70% of the company. Right, it's more like five, three, four. I don't know what it is, but it's it's not seventy five percent. It's not fifty percent. It's not thirty five percent unless they're doing stuff day to day. It's it's a low number of equity amount of equity, um, and I think that's mostly an education thing. Um, uh, not a lot of not even if they have started companies before, um, the equity equation was different back in the day too, and a, a lot of amazing faculty who have changed the world with their companies, honestly started the companies before there was really even a VC ecosystem. Um, there'd be like three VCs, um, and it was a new thing. So uh, I think just ed education is, is tough, and that's something we notice. And, and every school is different. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, uh, Boston's working really hard on creating this ecosystem. In fact, of a lot of places, I think Boston is, is working the hardest um, on really nailing its image. Providence is working really, really hard, too. Um, New York's working hard, too. Um, but M MIT and Harvard and, and BU and all of these schools are all right next to each other and have so much to offer. So a lot of the, the best teams we're seeing are cross schools, right? So cross registration is an amazing thing, um, but also... Uh, like normalization of, of these IP rules and sort of expectations on equity would be super helpful. Uncertainty, there's enough uncertainty in startups. Um, uncertainty in this kind of BS really ruins companies. Um, it's, I mean, Y Combinator notices forever ago. I mean, that's why they created the safe documents so that, hey, let's just standardize on seed documents 
we don't need to deal with this. Just everyone use the same documents. Trust us, they're good. And only YC could pull it off, right? Because only they had the scale ever to do it. And it's, a, it's an interesting way that Y Combinator is actually leveraging its position to, to make the entire ecosystem more efficient, which is cool. Yeah. Cool, so I'm gonna ask the last question. Yes, I love audiences. So my last question: Are you seeing any emerging from no. from? No. So yes. what, what are the most interesting that you're seeing? What what, what are the? Interesting for students or that? Yeah, yeah. Well, what's what's really cool is at least the few years I've been doing this, I've I've seen a, a few sessions go through. Um, and usually what you see people applying to the student accelerators for are the ones that are then getting funded by the accelerators. So it's maybe like a th student company is generally like three months ahead because they're the ones that are going to be applying to, you know, Y Combinator and Techstars and all these, these things. Um, so that's cool. So, so last year, for example, there was a huge trend towards um, massive kind of social impact companies. But I, I hate I hate to say social impact because you hear social impact and you immediately think, oh, so nonprofit or not big. But like, if you're going and like fixing the agricultural co commercial market in Pakistan, which is like a four trillion dollar market, you, it's not a small market. But it also has huge social impact. Um, it's just hard to tell story, and so we're noticing a lot of like a lot of founders coming to MIT specifically to solve big, gigantic problems, usually in infrastructure and logistics, and then going back and trying to tackle these hard problems. So we had like five shipping companies. We had a, 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 a port management company, actually, which is running machine learning on trying to get through, uh, like, actually um, plan when ships would arrive in ports, so ports could optimize that, and you could actually like, sell your, your slot in advance. So we were, I know we were talking about that. Um, now what I'm seeing uh, is back to sort of MIT technology big gigantic ideas. Um, and so uh, big ideas around energy, lots of clean water stuff, um, lots of material science. Material science um, seems, to, seems to be producing companies just in every industry right now. Maybe because for a while there weren't a lot of sort of tech startup material science kind of companies. I, I, don't, I don't know, but they seem to be finding their way into everything now. Um, so one of my favorite companies, for example, is Infinite Cooling. Just, yeah? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? yeah, that was cool. Um, so just noticing and then considering it a problem that, uh, actually anyone, so, so Anyone here know what the biggest use of fresh water in the United States is? It's cooling and power plants. I love how the guy who nodded when I said infinite cooling is the one to answer the question. But um, yeah, so it's it's power plants, right? So 49, 47 percent, something like a huge 49 percent of the water in the United States is actually used to cool power plants, not for drinking, not for anything else, to cool power plants. So they said, hey, we're going to recapture 80 percent of that water. We're going to recycle it back in the cooling system, and boom, now we've reduced the United States use of fresh water by 80% of 49%. So that's a boatload of money. And it's the whole world has that problem. Um, so you combine you know, great scientists uh, with actual startup hustle early, and then you send them into the ecosystem of Y Combinator investment, and that's just it's going to get crazy. The problems are just so big. And when you have a place like MIT or just this ecosystem of, of cultures from around the world, big, gigantic problems that people aren't shying away from, it's just incredible. Um, another one is, uh, one of my favorites is a company called Biobot Analytics. They, uh, they were a co combination of urban planning architect, so like a design person, um, but who was obsessed with cities and how cities ran, and a person that, uh, grew up with um, um, just a lack of fresh water. So just always thinking about water in her head. And she came to MIT as a microbiologist to study organisms in water. And they said, wait, why, why, can't we just, why can't we just 
have a real-time database of every of health in cities? Why can't we always know what's going on in the city? Why can't we predict outbreaks before there are symptoms anywhere? Why can't we sort of detect uh, when there's um, contaminants in water, in, in, like proactively? Why do we always have to wait for people to get sick? Um, and most of us would say, that's insane. You ha I mean, how are you going to know if something's wrong if people don't get sick? Well, they said, well, what are you talking about? We're scientists. Um, so that's what they do. They actually, in real time, monitor city water supply. And, and what they're doing now is attacking the opioid epidemic, which, which is actually the number one killer of men under 50, which is crazy. I had no idea. Um, it's, it's, it's absurd, right? Yeah, it's terrifying. Um, and it's rich people that are dying. Not, not poor people, because they, they go in and they get Vicodin or morphine for you know, a broken arm or something, and then they get addicted, and they die. Oh, they overdose. It's, it's crazy. Um, so they're tackling that problem first, which by itself, I mean, is billions of dollars a market. But then you move on to these, all these other things of just making the world run better, and it's just a hugely ambitious idea, which is amazing. Um, and that, that's what I like about being in the academic world, maybe seeing stuff that's underappreciated in the lab, and just encouraging everyone to, hey, try it. Just start, just start looking at the thing. I know it's scary and you got a PhD to finish and all that, but just, maybe, just, maybe just think about it, you know? Just think about starting sooner. Or hell, maybe it's, uh, there's huge impact just getting more um, researchers to maybe to think a little entrepreneurially earlier in their career. Maybe when they're just thinking about what they want to study or, or who they want to study with to increase the likelihood of, of translating some of their research. Um, so huge potential impact all, all over the place. Great, so on that note, let me just uh, open it up. No pressure. Yes. First victim. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nick, really appreciate that. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the lessons learned from the failures of, of the different startups? Yeah. Um, do I have to? Okay. Yeah. Um, lo lots of lessons learned. Um, basically, uh, one thing I have noticed, and, and uh, this is true for me, and, I, and I've seen it patterned a few other places, is that surprisingly the first time, as much as we like to say we need to educate everyone on how to do startups, the first time you may accidentally do almost everything right. Um, because at least if you start early and, and you, you sort of fall into the trap of making stuff, usually you're trying to make something for someone to make them happy. And your motivation at first, hopefully, is honestly, I made this thing, I'm going to make them smile. Or have them ask me to change it in some way. That's how a lot of people get started. Um, that's your fit, uh, at that point, you're, you're a lot of the way there, just thinking about how to make something people actually want. Um, it's when you start thinking too much about the business that everything starts to get screwy. And it's a really important thing to think about the business deeply. Um, but almost all the advice you hear is just kind of just do it. Number one rule is make something, give it to users, take their feedback, and keep going as fast as you can over and over again. It's kind of the, uh, like, hey, out, out work. Um, the reality, the actual thing is it's much more subtle than that. It's just that advice seems to cover most of the cases. Um, that's what happened with my game. Um, and it was later when I started thinking more about the business really early and forgot to really focus on making stuff for people um, that I kind of got overconfident, especially in my own abilities, and started trying to make bigger products earlier without shipping. Um, the other thing is, even for MileWise, while it was a success in the end, it was really a success because I'd learned to operate in the business world, right? And we all had. We were startup veterans at that point. Um, and we, we survived for three and a half years on not that much money for the amount of employees we had. We were extremely thrifty. Um, and being extremely thrifty lets you weather a lot of storms. Um, if you just don't die long enough, you'll probably be successful but sometimes you have to not die for nine years. Um, my, at the time, I was doing like my Combinator and I was close friends with the guys from Justin TV. I mean, those guys had some success, but it wasn't a massive success. They had a lot of revenue, but it wasn't this billion dollar company they wanted. They were doing maybe a couple million in revenue, 20 employees, but it wasn't really what they wanted. It wasn't, in, it wasn't until like nine years later that they stumbled on Twitch TV. They, sh they, dis they 
deleted 95% of the code they'd made and just focused on video games and boom. It was uh, six months later, product market fit, killed it, billion dollar company, right? Um, and so that happens a lot. With MileWise, our struggle was, is our customer the business traveler? Is our customer the mom planning vacation for the family um, and like watching? You know, this is our, this is our persona. Um, you know, it's, it's one of our personas was the mom wanting to plan the family vacation, basically managing the family's uh, finances throughout the year and basically wanted to make sure she was saving correctly. Whereas the business traveler wanted to spend all the time. Or is it companies like, uh, I believe it was BMW at the time who was taking ownership of their employees freaking flyer miles. And they were like, hey, we can use these for business traveler. We just argued, we argued a lot and then we never really completely made a decision. And so it cost us forever to be able to make a product that actually satisfied all those users. We did, you can, it's a route, um, but it is not, it is not beginner entrepreneurship, and uh, it was it was terribly it was a terrible struggle. I wish we hadn't done that. So that's one. Um, the other big one is don't do stuff out of fear. I joined Social Shield out of fear because I wasn't sure I could. I was trying to interview for a real job and wasn't sure I could find one. So instead of going out and actually maybe doing some consulting and looking around or finding my own idea that I was extremely passionate about, finding the right co-founders or hell even looking for what jobs may be out there that I may love, I kind of rushed into the first thing with f uh, famous founders and, and famous investors that I was given the opportunity to co-found. And um, great company, but not for me, great company for someone else. Um, so I, I think especially when you're young, but I think at all ages, I, I still do stuff out of fear sometimes and it's just does not turn out well. <laughs> Yeah, and then you feel bad about it later. And then you feel guilty about quitting. Uh, later, I got good at quitting sooner, or firing. I, I uh, helped out a friend startup for three months um, right before I did this MIT gig. And that's, that's when I really knew I wasn't ready for a startup again. I flew up to California, helped for three months. They were doing Y Combinator and needed some extra hands. And I said, hell, I'll help you with product. One of my closest friends, three months into it, uh, they mentioned something, Nick, you're clearly not into this. Like, and I, I didn't want to quit, but I knew also that I just, I just couldn't do it. Um, but it was just three months, and it was helpful, and I didn't you know, drag everyone down. Um, that's key. Uh, if you're not feeling it, just get out soon. No one's going to be super pissed at you. Um, Co-founder, well, maybe they are, but you know, don't, don't lose friendships over startups. Unless they're a really bad founder, then screw them. You know. That was long, sorry. Yes. So, um, software versus hardware. Um, oh, God. What's the uh, trend do you see at MIT? Um, yeah. A uh, lot more hardware this year. Um, obviously, there's a lot of hardware combined with machine learning. Um, uh, I mean, MIT has a lot of biotech. I, it's, 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 it's tough because I'm, I'm realizing year to year, you know, what people are excited about changes so quickly that it's less a trend. In fact, I, I'm starting to think that, especially with technology, not thinking about trends may be a good thing. I'm more thinking about what's act actively going on and how be human behavior is changing all the time. Um, but in general, we're seeing a lot more, we're seeing a lot more hardware. Um, but if it is hardware, it's big hardware. It's, uh, I'm not seeing like wearables. You know, I'm seeing power plant tech. I'm seeing you know micro thrusters for rockets, so it doesn't take as much fuel. Um, uh, like photonic chips, where they're using like quantum effects for machine learning instead of traditional chips. Um, what you'll see a lot of is like machine learning and hardware. We're taking data from wearables or IoT or, and then doing layering software on top of that to make something new. Because that ships faster. Um, yeah. It's a tough, tough answer. But uh, I, we, do, we did just start an MIT Hong Kong node because we want to have a presence in, in Shenzhen and, and Hong Kong. And, and um, so we do do, like I was just in, in Hong Kong for uh, a, a three-week um, 
uh, like maker slash entrepreneurship bootcamp. Um, and we combine Chinese students with MIT students and they actually have to make something. Um, they have to make a physical product and it has to you know, sell. Um, there's a lot of innovation around there, but uh, um, and we're doing a lot of stuff with, there's, you're gonna see some cool stuff coming out of like with making and you know, how does online learning look for making is a question we're posing right now. And that's something I'm really interested in. Like what, what is, what's Khan Academy for, for making physical objects? That's, that's an interesting question to wrestle with. That's what we're starting to do. I'm wondering if um, you see anything interesting going on in the financial market space right now? <laughs> yeah, oh, totally. Um, well, um, there, there, yeah. So I see remittance stuff. Um, so remittance is um, people come to the United States or, or any sort of relatively wealthy nation, get a job and send money back home. Um, traditionally, that's ex extremely expensive. Um, so we see a lot of stuff in that space. Um, no one necessarily has done it well yet. So I don't know, I, I'm not gonna say it's a good idea necessarily, but a lot of, that's the kind of stuff you're seeing. Um, uh, also, a lot of places on earth don't have markets basic markets um, for stuff like agriculture. Um, you know, um, I see over and over again, India, Pakistan, Thailand, China, um, you have this problem of, hey, I'm a farmer, um, I have cell phone service, so I can kind of get market prices, but I can't sell the stuff on the market anyway. Um, and so a lot of student teams and entrepreneurs will actually go and try and make like a financial market be like, oh, huge opportunity, developing world, financial market, no one's done the thing, I'm gonna make a financial market. In reality, the reason there's not a market is because you can't refrigerate the stuff. So like, what's the point in having a futures market if you can't store the thing for three days and sell it when the price is higher? So st stuff like that is really interesting. A lot of really cool ideas are coming from looking at the finance world, markets around the world, trying to do finance, and then realizing the problem's not finance at all, and then they do something else. Um, so four, three or four different startups just in the past few months started that way and they're doing really cool stuff, um, which is great. Um, alternative forms of, of, of risk and credit analysis. So I consider the US almost in like an aggressively third world nation when it comes to credit. We're, like we have a robust credit system, but it's so flawed in terms of security that it's almost worse than not having a credit rating system, um, at least for personal. Um, so you're seeing a lot of really cool stuff in the developing world, but hey, we don't have, if you don't have um, you know, banking records or traditional in banking infrastructure, how do you make credit ratings? And so you start looking at stuff like cell phone logs, and again, it's machine learning, but sometimes it's hardware. It's building hardware and integrating stuff sometimes. Sometimes it's telecom. You're seeing all these, all these technologies start to merge into really complex, really, um, logistically complex solutions, but in the product itself is super simple and kind of hidden. So you can leapfrog what we have here, which is really cool. So then once you have credit, what can you do? Then you're going crazy on the financial system and um, you can do stuff like, uh, once you have something like that, once you have a rating system, then international finance can come in and instead of aid organizations and massive foreign aid from like the United States, then like HSBC can come in and say, oh, there's ratings on these banks, analyzed it, okay, I've got a rating system, I can invest there. Um, and that just starts to make the whole system work better. Um, so you're seeing a lot of these, you know, you start one place and then you realize you need core infrastructure, but the, you know, the core infrastructure of law, communications, power, agriculture, those four things can really produce I mean, they're just massive, even in small poor countries are such massive markets, that's really fascinating. And, and really, to get it done, you don't need to necessarily be from there, but if you're willing to kind of go, dig in, and just do the thing, just do anything, you don't have to know any. just go and start, just say I'm gonna do it. Um, you can just, there's just incredible amounts of, of market opportunity there, it's really cool. Um, can you use small words? <laughs> uh, I'm at MIT, but not that, not that MIT. Uh, 
All right, so basically a financial market. What, what kind of complexity, for example? The answer is probably yes, but I want to make sure I'm answering yeah, So the right basically question. a financial market is a complex system. Yeah. But most people see it as linear, and so all the risk uh, modeling yeah, yeah. systems are linear rather than complex. Uh, I was actually just having this conversation with an MIT friend the other day. Um, so yeah, um, yes, but it's not new. Um, so a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the really big finance and solid trading and hedge funds have been using nonlinear, um, like risk models for a long time, um, because hey, if you, simple explanation is hey, if you're modeling, if 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 you're a fresh graduate from a computer science department, if you learned you've learned all about prediction models, you're going to go in and say, I know all about these things. I'm going to make a model with a Gaussian distribution that looks like this. But the world never quite looks like that. It's just close, right? So the the places with the really good mathematicians and the places that do 100% returns month over month over it will say, hey, we'll just actually map, actually map the risk curve. So there's this little difference between the model and reality over here. And hey, there's a ton of money right there. That's nothing, that's nothing new, which is kind of cool. But, um, but it's, an, it's, it's a really interesting thing you bring up because if you are, guys are like doing machine learning or anything, realize that um, your sort of standard models will never quite perfectly match the real world. Um, so there, if you are doing something like that, there's, there's always opportunity there for, for other people to sort of play on your model knowing that it's not perfect, um, which is cool. So yes, there's lots of that kind of stuff. Yeah. For the startups that you're involved with, uh, do you ever see them using crowdfunding and do you have any thoughts about crowdfunding? Yeah. Um, so I don't personally have a lot of experience with crowdfunding, but um, one of my coworkers um, um, started Ministry of Supply, and they did a massive, uh, a pretty successful um, Kickstarter. Um, I, I love the idea of crowdfunding. I think um, you got to be careful because it can get you into a bad place where you owe a lot of people a lot of product and a lot of, you kind of have to, manage the bad will over time. Um, because I, I just think you're gonna get your fun, you're gonna get your crowdfunding done and then that's the peak excitement level. And there's like where can you go? You can't go up without shipping, right? What's 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 more exciting than oh my God, I'm so excited. You basically convinced a bunch of people that the thing's gonna be real and you've convinced them enough to put money in, right? Uh, so you have to manage this sort of slow like descent into disappointment. And then they'll be excited when they actually get your product. So if there's stuff you can do during that process to slow it down and maybe get them excited or keep them involved, there's other stuff you can produce. That's, a, that's key to managing those campaigns. Um, but they work well. Um, I, I'm also really interested in like crowd equity grants as opposed to just like Kickstarter. You know, actually the, the crowd, you know, um, Opening, opening up startup investing to not quite retail investors, but you know, um, maybe more people that are, and you're, you're actually seeing crowdfunding platforms for equity sprouting up in every country. So I was just in Chile, and I can't believe what, I forget what it's called, but um, they've got actually a really successful crowdfunding platform down there um, for equity and startups. And, uh, um, it's just a really cool model, especially if a country does not have a robust venture capital community. It's a nice way to, to get, get it going and kick started. And then maybe if more people do it, um, you know, high income people, then it becomes more acceptable for people to join startups, right? Because hell, if, if my dad, the bank manager, is investing in a startup, then maybe it's okay for me not to go work at Goldman Sachs. Maybe I can start a company instead. Um, and I really like these sort of complex systems that arise when you just start to, when entrepreneurship starts to s fix small problems. Um, they start combining into greater, it's, a, it's much more than exponential growth and I think people don't realize that. When you create a startup, it's not just your money and uh, the people that work for you. There's all these sort of down the line things that can combine into massive growth, which is really cool. Um, I tend to go off on tangents, so I don't know if I answered your question, but we're seeing a lot. It's mostly in hardware, but also in games too, because a lot of VR content's being created and Project Greenlight is killing it on Steam. Um, so we see a lot of those too. Um, 
we just had a team do an ICO too for 40 million. So that was cool. Another form. I have two questions, uh, Nick, for you. One is um, this programs, what you were talking about, sandbox, fuse, yeah. all of that. Is yeah. it only for MIT students or is it for others um, to It's come for in? MIT uh, student founded companies. So um, uh, we want students to recruit the best co founders in the world. And that can mean someone in Thailand, or it can mean someone from Harvard, or it can mean, um, you know, uh, we have a, a lot of our students team up with surgeons, you know, at Mass General and Boston Children's and places. It's, um, it's a big one. So is it for entrepreneurs also to look for the co founders who will work for them? Um, so at least our programs, we do do stuff for alumni. Um, so we have something called VMS, which is uh, Venture Mentoring Service, which has been forever, but you basically get assigned a team of uh, advisors, and any alumni of MIT can take advantage of that. Um, so we, tr we try and do as much as we can to support the whole community, um, but we are education focused, and we are focused mostly on our students. Yeah, basically yeah. my, uh, this one is that education focus piece. Yeah. And the entrepreneurs get trained on that. Get sorry, get trained on that. Yeah, basically, yeah. like the accelerator sandbox program. Yeah, is it kind of a standalone course? Um, that's an interesting question. So sandbox is more of a fun, but we do. Um, there is a mentoring component to it. It's not really a course, but we do. Um, we have online courses too. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing we do is we we go and bring our courses to other teachers around the world or even locally. And so we are totally cool with anyone teaching our content or using our content. But the actual programs, the on-campus, in-person programs um, are for, for students and their teams and anyone else involved in the company. Okay. Um, that said, there's so much stuff so, you can just go and sit in. Yeah, I, I was looking for some course what I can take like yeah. Time off and go for yeah. some time. Well, there's also, uh, we do an executive education, uh, one week intensive boot camp thing where you actually mm -hmm. go through a bunch of our stuff and, and um, make teams and meet people from around the world, and that's really cool too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was yeah. more uh, curious on the creation side of it. And yeah. that's why I was so you're, you're interested in actually creating an incubator or something like that? Uh, yeah, basically yeah. get trained. Uh, yeah. And yeah. everything is practice. Yeah. You know? So I think for that, honestly, if you're interested in doing stuff like that, you should email us, because mm -hmm. that's cool. We love supporting stuff like that. Um, but no, we don't actually have a course yet on, we're getting there though, because um, for example, we do global startup workshop, and we just did that in Chile. I think the next one's probably gonna be in Thailand. Mm -hmm. but the whole point of those is to go and help locals um, uh, you know, accelerate innovation in a way. So we, we work with accelerators and, and co-working spaces and, and universities to talk about what we've learned about what works and doesn't work as well in these yeah. different things. I, I have a lot of questions, but maybe I'll catch up with you yeah. later separately. Yeah. But the second question, have you seen any startups, particularly in the agricultural space, related to logistics? Uh, yeah, oh, tons. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge area, which is kind of why I keep coming back to it. Um, Agriculture in general is just this hot pot mix of mm -hmm. energy, food, mm -hmm. biotech, logistics, um, power, all of it sort of comes together. And especially if you go anywhere, uh, in a lot of places in the world, everything ends up coming down to agriculture because you gotta feed people and you gotta get the food places. And in a place where 75 or 80% of the population is a, is a farmer, well, everything becomes agriculture. So there's tons of stuff, everything from, um, we have to make refrigerated um, transport better somehow. Um, you have to be able to get your stuff to markets and it not be spoiled, otherwise you're going to get gouged by loan sharks who do have a way of getting it there. Um, even the US uh, uh, refrigerated transport's a huge problem, yeah. right? Um, you can see these trucks going around Cambridge and they've just got air conditioners shoved on the front of them. And these things vibrate a whole bunch and they have to get fixed all the time just because the vibration destroys the air conditioner. You'd think that would be fixed, but it's not, right? And um, they're just separate diesel engines attached to the front. It's, it's crazy. Um, so uh, I don't know specifically what you mean in terms of logistics, but just, ton I mean, just logistics software too, yeah, planning uh, and everything. Software. Yeah. Basically, the planning and how yeah. efficiently you are going yeah. to. We have a company called, market. yeah, um, 
we had a, a Rwandan company called Kume that actually, uh, I'll shut up in a sec. We had a Rwandan company called Kume. It was basically, hey, because there's nothing here, let's just build a awesome thing from scratch. And they just gave all the drivers iPhones and mobile software and they have GPS powered. And you should see these markets. The markets went from the system where people who own trucks would hire drivers to drive the trucks. But then they gave the responsibility to negotiate the rates to the drivers. So the same people sort of in charge of security of the truck are like taking under the table payouts because they're negotiating the rates themselves. So nothing was efficient and there was no incentive anywhere to get anything anywhere. So just in one, in one swell, fell swoop, they get their own truck, get their own drivers, make their own app and go from zero to like three million pounds of shipments in a few months. And it's all highly efficient and organized and it's pretty cool. Same thing, other ones in, um, I read a Mexico City one too, which is more about security. Um, but the cool thing about logistics is it's, it's different everywhere and logistics means something everywhere you go, which is super cool. So you can't just do Uber for blah everywhere, right? You have to do Uber for blah in that place, um, which is one of the reasons Uber worked so well with the GM, local GM model. Um, so it's actually pretty clever that they do that. Anyway, I think I'm being told to shut up using with Carlos's eyes. <laughs> Not at all. I was just looking. If there's any some smaller questions? Yeah. Thank you. What uh, aspect of your job at the Trust Center or experience you've had there has been most surprising to you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, huh. I have I have no idea. Um, I think I'm, I'm definitely surprised by how okay I am with not working on the ideas, <laughs> um, which is a big one. I think I'm, I'm surprised by how many of the companies are not like science or hard tech companies. Um, they're kind of just this thing needs to get done. I'm also surprised, ooh, I'm surprised by how um, there is a certain cohort of people that I've discovered are naturally really good entrepreneurs, and those are doctors. Yeah. Um, they notice lots and lots of problems. Um, they uh, are trained to immediately try out solutions, and they're like hyper customer focused. And they're trained in, I mean, if anyone's watched House, you realize that the whole time you're trying to figure out what people actually, what, what's actually going on with people. So you're like, doctors are heavily, heavily, that's what rotations basically are, and taking histories. You're heavily trained in market research without knowing it. So you take those people and, and go through a three-month class, and all of a sudden they're incredible, um, which is really cool. And that's true of anyone that really goes through med school, um, like um, dental startups. There's a lot of dental startups, believe it or not. Um, so that's really cool. Um, and then I think the other thing I'm surprised by, and I, I kind of keep going to this international culture stuff just because it's been one of the most rewarding things for me is, is being exposed to how um, entrepreneurs can come from every culture. There's just different things in, in everyone's way. Um, and so it's really surprising to me how we can do a three and a half week program fuse over the winter and have and hear things like, you know, I, I, I grew up in China and didn't really know about leadership or creativity or problem solving at all really. Like just, you had to just do the thing and my parents don't believe in entrepreneurship or anything like that. And I realized when I started this program, I didn't realize how hard entrepreneurship would be. But I also learned I can do it. That's really cool, this idea that something can be harder than you thought it was gonna be but that learning that you can actually do it. That was really exciting. So I think, I think I learned that entrepreneurship can be taught and especially coming from kind of my background um, where I thought just crazy, you know, um, ADD people who like to hack all the time and can't listen to rules are entrepreneurs. I think, I just don't think that's true anymore. I think it's more like if you really, really want to and you really, really care, hell yeah, you can be an entrepreneur. Hey, thanks so much for having me.
stick around, enjoy the food, and uh, we'll hang out for a few more minutes here in the, in the space. And thank you for, for tonight.